<laughs> so uh, anyway, we're going to start with this. I mean, there's uh, um, obviously one of these new emerging topics uh, that we've been sort of the experiencing uh, last three years in quite a bit high frequency. Uh, so we're going to talk about GABAergic antiparasitic drugs uh, and possible toxicity. I just have to um, declare some commercial disclosure interest for me and my brother who basically was part of the team who analyzed uh, data. So in terms of the purpose, basically what really we wanted, we wanted actually to see the incidence and clinical features of retinal toxicity associated with commonly used antiparasitic drugs with a GABAergic mechanism. And when you think about basically uh, uh, problems, again, we, s we kind of for years noticed possible issues, but the last three years since 2015, basically that dramatically increased. And the uh, drugs that we particularly focused uh, were heartworm preventive medications. And in terms of medications, you have ivermectin, moxidectin, milbamycin, oxime. And they're facilitators of GABA binding to GABA receptors in the mammalian system. And in terms of facilitation, ivermectin is the most potent than moxidectin. And then you have this whole group of isoxazoline uh, compounds which have been developed and on market since 2015, which are oral anti-flea and anti-tick medications like uh, Nexgard, Brevecto, Simperica, Cordelio, and then Spinosat, basically, which is P-glycoprotein inhibitor, which has been on market for six or seven years. So in terms of the possible FDA warnings, uh, FDA issued warnings on Spinosad in uh, racing greyhounds because they noticed increased incidence of the CNS problems in some uh, 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 racing greyhound communities with concurrent use of ivermectin and Spinosad. And the study from 2011 showed that basically uh, Spinosad can increase uh, serum ivermectin concentration for almost 400%. So basically, if you give one dose of ivermectin, you're going to effectively increase that dose for four times in terms of bioavailability when concurrently using some of these drugs. So in terms of the methods, we had basically uh, three groups that we analyzed. First group of dogs was actually 83 dogs that uh, we evaluated during regular uh, OFA um, uh, surf type of the examination. And those are dogs which had a regular deworming protocols using, um, I apologize, this is a mistake, it's 200 micrograms per kilogram. So a lot of uh, big kennels actually use these protocols, especially for big dogs, because it's very, very cheap. So basically use ivermectin 1%, you give 0.2 ml per 10 kilo body weight. The group two were 105 dogs that we uh, basically identified as possible uh, retinal toxicity dogs associated uh, with the use of these drugs. And you have a list of different medications that we observed. And then group three was actually a double mask study that we conducted in Iowa and Czech Republic, where we basically randomly screened dogs for chromatic pupil light reflex uh, abnormalities. And we had a 485 dog screen in the US and 108 dog screen in Czech Republic. Uh, reason for two groups in Czech Republic, they do not have a heartworm, so they do not use heartworm medications. Obviously, in Iowa, uh, almost uh, everything is on hardware medications. So in terms of the methodology, group one had a regular ophthalmic eye examination. Group two had a, a chromatic PLR responses ophthalmic examination in EEG recordings. And group three basically had a, a chromatic PLR evaluation. So in terms of the group three, we, it was double masked again, randomized study uh, with age matching, so median age for both groups for 5.5 years. Breeds distribution was similar. The major difference was that intact dogs in the Czech Republic groups were prevalent, so there were almost 95% intact dogs versus Iowa, where 95% were basically uh, spayed neutered dogs. Okay, so basically in terms of the first group, uh, commonly used uh, in a lot of large kennels, we evaluated 83 dogs. Out of 83 dogs, 52% had retinal lesions. So basically it's a very, very high um, number of dogs having retinal lesions. 
And when you look in a specific breed distribution, uh, you can see that a lot of these breeds had almost 100% incidence in terms of the retinal lesions. And then if you look in uh, a Golden Retrievers, they were around 70%, Basset Hounds 35%, and Labrador Retrievers 33%. So which means there is definitely breed predisposition or susceptibility to toxic effects of the ivermectin when given in this off-label manner. Um, these images were uh, partially shared on the listserv uh, probably eight, eight months ago. Um, so you can see typical pattern of core retinal, like bull eye type of the lesions. They're usually perivascular in these dogs. But a lot of dogs actually had with these very, very tiny focal hyperreflective lesions, which you can usually see in superior retina between 11 and 2 o'clock. So basically, and it's usually far, far periphery, very close to the edge of the tapetum. Um, so, because obviously retina is the most thinnest there. Uh, what's particularly problematic, some of these dogs basically had the lesions which had uh, actually dysplastic appearance, and some of these dogs had lesions which actually looked like folds. And I had a chance to see a couple of these dogs after ivermectin has been withdrawn, and these type of the lesions would disappear. So this obviously creates a problem in terms of the regular eye certification process, where you basically call something a uh, fold or dysplastic lesion, but actually can be drug-induced toxic lesion. Uh, group 2 is probably clinically the most relevant. Uh, in terms of group 2, we had a, basically four groups of visual system deficits evaluated and detected. Uh, the vision issues uh, were, which we detected were nyctalopia, adept perception problems, close object uh, problems and far object detection problems. In terms of chromatic PLRs, no red, uh, poor red and good blue responses. In terms of the fundus lesions, usually we've seen core retinal lesions, perivascular retinal degenerative changes. And in terms of the ERG deficits, we've seen decreased uh, 20 hertz flicker, negative B wave, and full field ERG amplitude suppression. So basically we've seen variety of the combination of these type of the uh, clinical symptoms in dogs with suspected drug toxicity. Uh, can we have this video, please? So you can see this dog, this is what we called early jump depth perception oh. type of the issue. Can we repeat this video again? So dog is starting here and it's almost jumping on the bar oh. itself. So basically this dog actually went from, this was the first behavior that they noticed. It would jump way, way early and then it would even hit on the bars. And that's a lot of dogs actually came from the agility com community because these people are really observant and they would say this dog doesn't like to go in a tunnel anymore. It has a problem with the height. It has a problem uh, crossing the bars. When you look in the full field ERG depression, this is one of the dogs. This is Sheltie actually, which was on hard guard for 10 years. Never had any problems, started to have a problems in agility course. Uh, and with the DRG, you can see severe depression of A and B wave five days after heart guard. This is 21 days after heart guard. So ERG basically completely normalized. And when we withdraw the heart guard, basically this dog completely normalized behavior in agility testing within three months. So that's pretty much indicative that you had a sort of the toxic type of the response, amazingly, after 10 years of drug use. This is a miniature schnauzer, which basically presented as well with nyctalopia. So this is flicker ERG. You can see flicker uh, stimuli here, no peaks. Uh, heart guard was discontinued at six months post-drug. Nyctalopia resolved, and you can see uh, partial recovery of the flicker ERG amplitudes as well. Uh, this is uh, what we call negative B waves. So basically, you're going to have A wave and B wave, which is going to be quite a bit small. Uh, this basically dog uh, was on combination of ivermectin and spinozad. And after uh, withdrawing both of the drugs, ERG basically normalized in this patient. So when you look in, in terms of the groups of the dogs and drugs that we observed, we had a 68 dogs in a, a possible ivermectin toxicity. Uh, group and of these 68 dogs, this is basically distribution in terms of the abnormalities 62% vision problems, CPLR abnormalities 68%, fundus 68%, and ERG 
basically 100%. So every single dog where we did the ERG basically had the ERG abnormalities. We did also have some isolated uh, incidents of the next guard in Bravecto without any heartworm medications, uh, and then new drugs, Cradelia and Cyperica as well. And then we probably, the second biggest group is combination of the next guard with the heartworm medications, and you can see fairly similar percentages. So basically from the standpoint it seems that the ERG basically is the most sensitive test for detecting this type of the problems in this population. In terms of the group three, so basically uh, we had a screening of dogs where we looked at chromatic PLR abnormalities, which was done by uh, referring veterinarians. And obviously referring veterinarians can pick up something which is really, really major or gross. So basically when we did a cutoff value for data analysis, we said basically the deficit has to be at least 50%. And usually a majority of the, these dogs had a no red or very, very poor red and good blue responses. So when you look in Czech Republic, we had only one dog out of 108 dogs with CPLR abnormalities, while in Iowa we had 102 dogs out of 487, so basically around 21%. When we did a calculation of the risk or odds ratio, the, it was around 28.35, highly significant, which pretty much translates basically the dogs which are on ivermectin, and that was the Iowa group, those were... Uh, had almost 30 times higher risk of having chromatic pupillite reflex abnormalities. Obviously, I mean, we did not record in these dogs possible use of oral uh, uh, medications of uh, isoxazalin group, so basically that's also a possible contributing factor. So in terms of the conclusions, basically uh, we observed high level of retinal toxicity uh, in dogs exposed to off-label diluted ivermectin. Uh, we've seen that regular ivermectin products, which are FDA approved, can have a potential to cause retinal toxicity and cause visual disturbances. And we definitely seen that oral isoxazalin flea and tick medications have a potential to cause retinal toxicity. Uh, last week, the FDA issued a warning and uh, mandatory label change for all isoxazalin uh, uh, drugs uh, because of the increased incidence of seizures and CNS problems. So that's going to be coming as a new labeling, and hopefully once when this manuscript gets published, uh, there will be additional labeling in terms of the visual system abnormalities as well. So what would be something that we as a group of ophthalmologists could recommend, and, and that's something that I'm frequently asked, uh, basically, uh, one of the things that I um, actively advocate is mandatory evaluation of vision and uh, retina for all dogs receiving ivermectin, prolonged release moxidectin and isoxazilin products annually. So every dog which basically is on these products technically should have uh, basically this type of the evaluation done annually. Then stop using uh, concentrated ivermectin solution in an off-label manner because obviously we have high incidence of toxicity. One additional idea, if safety of non-ivermectin products is of superior for melibomycin oxime, eliminate use of ivermectin-based products, and then eliminate use of isoxazalin products or oral flea and tick medications in animals with pre-existing retina and inflammatory eye diseases. The problems that I had, I had at least a run of five or six cataract surgery dogs that I operated on that went perfectly fine, and then within a week after getting uh, some of these products, had a dramatic decrease in vision and development of the retinal degenerative changes. Uh, the issue is that if you have a blood retinal barrier which is damaged, especially after cataract surgery, you give these drugs, they're gonna reach the eye in very high concentration, and obviously that can be very, very toxic. Uh, the second type uh, of the problem is that clinical presentation in a lot of these dogs frequently cannot be differentiated from autoimmune retinopathy dogs. So sometimes we absolutely do not have idea whether that dog has an early SARS or basically whether it's a, just a drug toxicity, which really, really complicates things. So that's kind of the new stuff. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Prior to the uh, <clears throat> development of ivermectin, uh, which came out in the, probably the 80s, uh, I had seen lots of dogs with similar lesions in the retina. Uh, <clears throat> I ascribed them to multiple inflammatory disease, 
Uh, lots of them went away. Some of them persisted and scarred over. So I'm not so sure that those lesions that you showed were definitive ivermectin based on the fact that I've seen things like that long before ivermectin. Thank you. Well, that's a good point. Uh, basic, the incidence for the suspicion actually is uh, established on the clinical response. If you have clinical lesions, decreased DRG, decreased PLR, uh, decreased uh, visual performance, and you withdraw the drug, and everything starts to improve, that pretty much is sort of the indicator that actually uh, you may have a drug toxicity. So. So thanks yeah. very much for bringing this to your attention, Sunisha. I think this is an important thing that warrants further um, very objective study. It strikes me that really this is something that should be a toxicity trial. If you're seeing um, the, the, that percentage of changes on the ERG, I'm having a bit of a problem resolving the lesions that you showed, though, um, with presumably the underlying pharmacologic pathogenesis of the gabinergic neurons, right? Because you're showing lesions which look like they're retinal pigment epithelium or choroidal, there's pigmentary changes, you're losing photoreceptors, but you've got areas of hyperreflectivity. Um, and I'm not sure how we would, you know, we'd, I'd be thinking about what's happening with the amacrine cells, what's happening with the horizontal cells, possibly the bipolar circuitry. And it's hard to to really associate that. I think those are very non-specific sorts of retinal changes, as Seth alluded to. Um, in terms of, like, for example, the amacrine circuitry, what, how did the OPs look? It looked like one of the traces you showed, I didn't see any oscillations on the B wave, but did you isolate the OPs? Yeah, we didn't really look in oscillatory potentials to try to isolate them. That's a very good point. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the lesions have a quite a bit of variability in clinical appearance, and it's completely different compared to GABAergic toxicity seen in humans. In children, you have a basically GABAergic toxicity associated with Wigabatrin, which is seizure medication. And in children, usually you see the peripheral visual field constriction, thinning of the nerve fiber layer, and you can see that negative B wave, obviously. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, it's kind of uh, similar, if you look at any literature data, or obviously all of us seen clinical cases of dogs overdosed with ivermectin, you're going to see these core retinal lesions, which have more of the inflammatory type of the appearance rather than anything else. I'm suspicious that there is a possible vasculitis type of the problem or the vascular toxicity as well associated with high doses, but this is speculative at this point. Yeah, I think certainly we should encourage um, trying to find some funding for, for actual toxicity studies um, with visual evoke potentials and really... That's, we're kind of planning on doing OCT and uh, ERGs in mice with a gradual exposure to um, elevating doses of ivermectin. My colleague Angelica is here, so we talked about it yesterday, so hopefully that will come in the near future. Hi, it occurred to me with your visual deficits that some of them could be attributed to lenticular sclerosis, and I'm wondering if you refracted the dogs to account for, uh, you know, to see if there's an association between those deficits and just good old uh, uh, presbyopia. Yes, we did refract them. Unfortunately, none of them had any kind of the refractive errors. Thank you very much. Um, okay.